talk about a real challenge. So she asked for that, and it went all the way up to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals, and the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals says, we're going to allow you to buy a community case. We agree with you that your requirement that she work here instead of working at home is an essential function, and you don't have to waive that essential function and require her to stay here because teamwork, they agreed, was an essential function of that job. But I notice this stuff right here. Okay? All of these service coordinators work their entire shift at the office. They had never permitted a service coordinator to work anywhere else than in their office. And they can't be, added, uh, they can't be adequately trained or supervised if they're not there. Now, if any, obviously, if any one of these things were different, they made exceptions to that policy to be a whole different result here. And this is what protected the communications in this case. But what a tragic case. Uh, talk about a difficult call. Okay, let's go through this one. Let's get, this is another, another significant challenge is the leave request. Okay? I mean, is there someone who it just really feels like he or she wants to read? Anybody? Yes, thank you. Jim works for ADA, for ABLE, ADLA, a nonprofit organization that receives GWLD funds. Let me explain what that means. Uh, they get federal funds to find jobs for individuals with disabilities. Okay? And they have to maintain a certain ratio of employees with disabilities to be eligible for those funds. Go ahead. In applying for the job, Jim voluntarily self-reported his running president. ABLE, which is custodial care contracts with the local Air Force Base, developed a policy mandating termination after two unexcused absences or three unexcused tardies and policy prohibiting leave until an employee has worked six months. Because of his depression and medication, Jim was put on notice following one unexcused absence and two unexcused tardies when he asked for leave to obtain treatment and adjusted medication. Jim's manager said he'd think about it and get back to him next week. Two days later, Jim was tardy because of his medication and was terminated. Okay. What do you think? You got a problem? But they've got a policy, right? Why have a policy? I, I, I'm not picking on you. It's a very, I'm really glad you said that. Can't we enforce the policy here? Okay, what do we pass Bell? The timing is such a critical issue here. He comes forward before the shoe drops and requests. Uh, I believe he's, he's trying to engage, he's trying to interact. Okay, Mel says timing is critical. He makes a request before he's going to be absent again. What if, what if the reverse happened where he was absent again and then came in and said, well, the reason I was absent is because I had to go see my doctor to get treatment for the depression you knew about. Okay? That's where things really get tough. That's where you need to sit down with your lawyer and your team and talk through it. And another thing, another thing, I just another takeaway is before you make any kind of adverse employment decision, you must, you must ask any and all supervisory staff who have responsibility for the employee. Has this employee asked for any accommodation request? And if you don't, you will find that in most cases, a request has been made and just ignored. And if that's the case, and there was a termination, you've got liability. So please do that due diligence as well. Okay, this is right out of the EEOC. 
guidance. I'm not going to read it to you. The bottom line is employers cannot apply no fault leave policies, which result in automatic terminations uh, if they need additional unpaid leave as a reasonable accommodation, unless it would be an undue hardship. There may be cases where that is an undue hardship. But that's the exception rather than the rule. Okay. Okay, we're going to talk now about a scent-free workplace. So is this a scent-free conference? <laughs> is it? Okay. Everybody has to take charge. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Okay. How many of you have had to deal with this issue? Okay, it's becoming more and more common. Isn't it? Okay. All right. Who's going to read this one? A volunteer from the audience. Will you do that for us? Thank you. Amy, a recently acquired secretary informed her supervisor that she's diverse from asthma and has multiple chemical sensitivities such that exposure to some sense of prayers may result in an anaphylactic shock. The supervisor has come to you to discuss Amy's request. Fans in her cubicle put the sign post around the office and notices to her coworkers, asking them to refrain from using scented soaps, shampoos, and deodorants. Okay. You know what? I'll let you. I'll let you choose someone else to answer that if you want. Okay, hey, where's Peggy? Okay, you're instant friends now. Go, <laughs> good. So Peggy, what do you do here? I try to help her. Okay. It is a problem in the office that is only like dots and usually people like this who are sensitive. It doesn't take very much friendship. And um, try to look at her work environment. I mean, that does that tell people, you know, I can tell you things are half an hour ago, I was wet. Then it's just that's not the problem. So are these are any of these requests maybe unreasonable right here? Okay, you're good with that. Okay, let's Peggy, why don't you finish the story here? Can you read this? Two weeks later, Amy has a zero Disciplinary action is now demanded. Okay. Yes, in the back. Do you have the policy? Okay. Do you have a policy? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What if you do? What if you have a policy that says no, no set of fragrances here in the office? What if she goes into a public store that has a sense of, I mean, it's, she's not a uniform. Chase here, great discussion. Every every decision that has addressed this matter has basically said we don't have to create a pristine environment. But these are the kinds of things that are deemed reasonable. This is an unpublished decision, but I think it's still illustrative. Um, this is what the this is what the employer did. The employer asked them not to do it. They instituted a policy. Uh, they reminded employees and and installed air filters and fans and relocated the plane. So this was good enough. Okay, but to then say, no, you're fired, no. Okay. There's got to be a balance. Okay, let's talk about parking. Okay, parking is a fun one. Um, Clark, will you read this? Richard, the program manager, has to come out with the players up in extreme temperatures. He has asked Okay. 
Okay. Ask her why. Ask her why she intends to decline it. Okay. So what if she says, we only allow our supervisors and managers to have parking places. We don't have enough. Then what? And that's our policy. Okay. What's that? Replace Alley. Reassign Alley. Okay. Okay. Especially if she has a parking spot. <laughs> Especially if she has a parking spot. Yeah. Okay. Now what? Now this is a very sticky issue. This is a sticky issue up at the Capitol complex, where we have limited numbers of, you know, although compliant, a limited number of accessible parking stalls. But we have, with our aging workforce, more and more employees we have. Challenges with mobility. What do you do? Okay. Now it's obviously different. If you don't provide parking, if you don't provide parking for other employers as a benefit of employment, this is how we need to look at this because the ADA requires us to accommodate so they can participate in the equal benefits and privileges of employment, right? Okay. So, but if we are providing parking for employees and this individual is covered, would it be an undue hardship to let's use that I love your decision out let's let's put them in Ellie's place. This is where there's real tension if you have supervisors who don't want to give up their place. Yes, of course. They, they may be in the same same boat. Okay, I'm gonna. We're, we're just gonna. I've got to wrap up here, folks. Um, bottom line is, with shifts and over time, if you're if you have a policy and you're consistent and there's a business necessity, then you can actually impose and require uh, that employees work these shifts, even notwithstanding an accommodation request. This is one where an employee asked to be excused from rotating shifts because of, a, of a, an impairment and bottom line is consistency and i find again in this process i find that they're often inconsistent for other non-medical reasons and if that's the case you've got to grant the request okay do you ever have to mo monitor an employee's medication as an accommodation request what do you think no. Okay. More and more employees are saying, I need you to help me monitor when I take my medication to make sure I do that. Okay, it's not a reasonable accommodation. Okay, service animals. Um, we're gonna move on. Sorry folks. We have new Title II regulations from the Department of Justice as to what a service animal is. Uh, we had we used to have a law in Utah that had emotional support animals equated to service animals with criminal penalties. That was repealed two years ago. Uh, so, um, something to be aware of. Okay. I want to talk, I want to wrap up with this and then, can I go to a quarter two? Is that okay, quarter two? Okay. Who likes to knit? Anybody? Anybody? Will you read this one for us? Okay. Because I have a nurse in the jail who thinks she should be able to do the city Okay. Robert, an administrative assistant, has recently been admitting in staff meetings after the last staff meeting of the legal Robert's manager felt that his knitting was a distraction and asked him to stop knitting in staff meetings. Robert then volunteered that he had ADHD and he felt that he felt this during staff Okay. You know, since you're handling this, let's have, why don't you hunt this to some, oh, go ahead.
Good point. Good point. Okay. Let's. But in this case, we got the ADHD. Okay. Well, okay. Now. How do you not make sound kind of Peggy, are you that cynical? Okay. Are you really? I don't okay. Now remember, I, I made these scenarios, so I make the rules. You can't change it. Okay. We have to assume these folks are covered in this analysis. And that she has ADHD, and that's a covered impairment. Okay. So she's. Yes, we have documentation. She's covered. Okay. So. Do you have to let Robert in in staff meetings? Yes, over here. But I'm in charge of taking minutes. Okay, interesting. Yes. Put the complainer at the other end of the table. Okay. Interesting. Yes. I'm the boss, and I have ADHD, and drives me crazy if he next. Okay. Thank you, because this is what happens, isn't it? In, in our workplaces, it's, it's part of the fun. I don't mean, it's nutty. It's crazy sometimes, right? Okay? But these things come up. You know, we were talking about this at one of our national conferences, and one of the ADA coordinators said, I, I have ADHD, and when I did, I can focus better and remember what's happening in staff. Okay? Now, can it be a distraction? Yes. Can you entertain a, a notion of can we give that person something else constructive to do so that <coughs> he or she is focusing and doing things? And absolutely. So you have that, that array of options to take to take advantage of. But the reason I put this is the last scenario, aren't you glad? No more reading. But, but I just want us all to realize that we can't just be knee jerk and thinking something is goofy like an anti gravity machine. This is kind of right up there. We need to be looking at how we might be able to accommodate and that some things are reasonable. May not, may not seem so on the surface, but with further digging, maybe. Okay? But you've got some great solutions here. But bottom line is, you don't just reject this outright. You engage in the interactive process. You can come up with a solution that works. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up here again. Always, you all know the Job Accommodation Network, right? Please, if you're ever in litigation, and you're, if you ever, you're always going to be asked by plaintiff's counsel in a failure to accommodate case, did you ever call the job accommodation network? And if you can't say you did, you got a problem. So make sure you're doing that. Okay, lastly, these are the consequences. In 2004, the EEOC did a best practices study of 14 participating states. We were one of those states. And among the best practices they noted was this provision in our policy. And I commend it to you, to, and maybe you're already doing this, but essentially what this means under our policy, if, an, if one of our insureds does not accommodate or denies an accommodation request and doesn't consult with us first to get our consent, we can exclude coverage. The reason we have that there is because not everyone gets this. We have a big team. We can talk. We can help with resources if necessary. And this promotes a dialogue where we're avoiding liability. And we have found this to be remarkably successful over the years. So something you may want to think about. It's worked well for us. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Pleasure to see some familiar faces. Have a fun conference and travel home safely. Thank you. Thank you.